I think what uh, what we could do is if we could divide the conversation because I, I'm 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 here. You you can ask me as many questions as you like. We can try and club these issues into a few. We can say, okay, let's look at media ownership. Let's look at media. Yeah, let, let's thematize it. Yeah, I, uh, can, I can identify okay, students so, and then so, we can so, do so it. So we say media yeah. regulation could be one theme. Mm. We could say media ownership could be another theme. And we could talk about issues relating to freedom of expression yeah. and tolerance or intolerance, if you like. So these could be some of the broad themes. So if any of you want to ask me, shall we start? Yeah. So with I, can, I can identify them quickly because I know so most of them. Shall we do start with what? Media yeah. regulation? So I think the initial thread was looking at how even though methods of disseminating information appear to create an image of diversity, the actual sources are not really that diverse, right? That even though you have a large number of newspapers, la massive penetration of mobile phone networks, you're hearing the same thing or the same version from multiple sources. That was one theme. And then I think uh, you were deliberately keeping your talk le uh, example or light on examples because maybe we can engage with the examples in the questions also but around the problem of paid news or around around the problem of cross ownership of media across different uh, different sectors there are of course numerous examples that many of you might have heard of so certainly those questions can also be discussed right uh, so who wants to go first okay imam there right just push the button down. yeah hi i'm emon i'm in the fifth year so um, I'm inquisitive about how independent news forms like in the form of podcasts which are available on your phones and online, how they're regulated in India and if there is actually a regulatory mechanism. All right. Uh, let me come to you. You are saying how do independent news forms of news like podcasts or videos that you put on YouTube, how do you regulate them? Answer right now, it's not regulated. Uh, all right. Okay. No, I'll, I'll, I'll link podcasts with the whole other thing. First thing is something that I need to mention to you is do you know what is the biggest business on the internet? Answer pornography. Huh? I'm, I'm just stating facts. Point two is today what YouTube and access to YouTube has done is in a sense it's taken citizen journalism to a new level in the sense that today the ability to take pictures, to record voice, to take not just still pictures but moving pictures is literally available in the palm of your hand. So today every citizen has the wherewithal, not every citizen, a very substantial section of the citizen has a wherewithal to be a journalist. But can every citizen be a journalist? And here I say no. Why? It's the ability to communicate, it's how you communicate, how well you take pictures, how well you speak. Most importantly, how effective is the way you are able to reach out to an audience? How well do you tell a story? How well is your story structured with a beginning, a middle and an end? Where do the songs and the dances come in? Where does the sex and the violence fit in? You know, again, why am I saying this? <coughs> whether it be a podcast, whether it be a video that's put up on YouTube, just that it's become that much easier for you to put it up, it's become that much easier for people to manipulate that picture, to manipulate that audio. So, for instance, morphing of pictures, morphing of videos, you today have the tools to do that. Now, second point is, and I'm bringing this up because the whole ethics of sting operations come in here. You are ostensibly violating a law, including an individual privacy, by recording the voice or the pictures of a person without her or his consent. How do you justify a sting operation in public interest? You are saying, I am actually deceiving, I'm, I'm indulging in an act of deception 
I am actually I'm a journalist, but I'm not telling the person that I'm a journalist. I'm I'm pretending to be somebody else, and I'm secretly recording you without you knowing that this little pen of mine is actually a recording device, and this briefcase I'm holding has a picture which is being taken and everything. But I am justifying what I'm doing and putting it out in the public domain because I am quote unquote exposing corruption in high places. I'm highlighting. Issues which are supposed to be of public interest. That's how I justify a sting operation. The ethics of it, the logic of it. Now, today in India, we have nothing of that sort happening. And I dare say it's happening across the world, which is why the credibility of what you see is a huge question. Let me, I mean, I, let me elaborate on what I said one at a time. The Central Board of Film Certification. Right now, there are three categories, or actually four. You have U, UA, and A. You have a fourth category, which is special audiences. Suppose you want to make a documentary where you show a man's heart being cut up. You don't show it to a, a, a general audience, but you can show it to an a, a audience of doctors or, or whatever. If you want to show a woman delivering a child, you can show it to a, an audience of gynecologists, but you can't show it to a general audience. So right now, there's a proposal to have many more categories, but so forth. So this is supposed to be a board of film certification. But as you know, Mr. Well, thanks to Mr. Pelaj Nihalani, we know it sometimes there's a little more than certify films. One body. Body number two is the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting itself, the licensing authority. Suppose a particular television channel in your state, it shows a former governor of yours, right? Uh, uh, little pictures of him taken by two women on their cell phone and this elderly gentleman is having a good time. You know this story I'm telling you, no? Indira ka Savari, no, Indira ka Pujari, Sanjay ke Savari, na nar na nari, Narendra Tiwari, former governor of Andhra Pradesh. His own son had to drag him to court before he acknowledged him, before he gave a drop of his blood. And he said something in public which the media didn't because he used a, a word which is not supposed to be shown. He says, I have fought for decades to tell the world that they should know who's the real bastard. It's not me. So the television channel said, who's the real bleep? Okay? So you're not supposed to say fuck and shit. Hmm? Hmm? Do your professors utter these words in class? I'm doing it. Huh? It's on YouTube. All right. You bleep it out. Now, why, why am I telling you all this? Because this issue of regulation comes in now. The Ministry of Information and Broadcasting issues a license, therefore can sustain the license, can cancel the license. And it, in fact, has done to various channels. FTV is supposed to be un, not Indian, therefore it's told not to show it. There are many such examples you can find. But that's not where it ends. You know, it acts on the basis of complaints from people, but look at what happened, say, in, in, in the US, the infamous Janet Jackson episode. In the middle of a sporting event, there was Justin Timberlake uh, who pulled off her, her, her dress, and she later described it as a wardrobe malfunction. In India, we also have wardrobe malfunctions, and they keep getting shown on television again and again, but wait. In America, the television channel had to pay a fine first before it could appeal against the imposition of the fine in a court of law, the Federal Communications Commission. We don't have these laws in India. We have a different set of laws. So the, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting can cancel your license. It's a bit like saying, bad boy, stand at that corner, hold your ears and go up and down ten times. You know, it's a bit like that. Don't do it again. Show cause notice, Karan the cow notice. Then you also have something called the Press Council of India. Quasi-judicial body set up by an act of parliament with no pass. I was a member. It's only confined to the print medium. It can't punish anybody. Can't impose a fine. Can't put a person behind bars. It can only say admonish. Very bad. You should not have done this. Very bad. Why did you do it? Severe. Censure. You have the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, Techno Commercial Regulator, 
famous case it says according to the contract in a one hour news cycle or, or in a broadcast cycle you can only have so many minutes of ads if that's part of your contract why are you violating it they all go to court are you want to kill us you want us to shut down shop if we don't get advertisement how do we pay salaries still still pending in court cert computer emergency response team wait in bangalore when people from northeastern india are scared and trains have to be got for them so they can go back to guwahati that's because somebody has been sending out wrong kinds of messages but that same cert sometimes goofs up it you have a small fly you use a big hammer a sledge hammer to swat it arindam choudhury famous mr pony tail who used to run an institute he still runs it called the indian institute of planning and management now he made a complaint to the crt please block the urls all these urls had they said not very pleasant things about him said he's not doing this he's not doing that he's a bad guy he's bad he's finally lost the case you'll find it in this book but the crt also blocked a url the universal Re resource Lo locator of a website of a body called the university grants commission the ugc of the government of india why because the ugc had one placing no we haven't given him permission to run this course then you have self regulatory bodies right three of them b triple c nbsa news broadcasting standards authority former chief justices have been heads of that you have b triple c broadcast complaints broadcast consumers complaints commission i'm sorry i, I don't remember that you have triple a i ad, uh, no ascii advertising standards council of india 30 years later they suddenly say you know these are bad ads you know it tells you how you can become fair and ugly in one week most widely sold cosmetic in india fair and ugly you didn't know sorry well, it's called fair and ugly hindustan lever hindustan unilever a close of associate of unilever one of the biggest multinational corporations in the world they control the why is it called unilever it controls the levers of the universe it used to be said but wait you have a young girl who does a rap video showing in kodai canal about some mercury thing they issue a 10 page press release after that but this is the most widely sold cosmetic in india we export it to africa in case you didn't know fair and ugly cream now 30 years later suddenly the advertising standards council of india which is a self regulatory organization wakes up and said is this violating a law we have a law which says you know can't have these magical remedies and objectionable advertisements something 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 big long act you know so i'm saying to give you a very long answer to your short question at this juncture we have regulatory anarchy in our country we are depending on the public the remote in your hand your decision what to hear what to view what to watch you had a whole case of this such ka samna where the delhi high court actually said that you know you uh, shift the timings now are these days children instead of watching a tv program at 8 o'clock and watch it at 12 o'clock even if it's a 8 year old or a 10 year old but at least that's some way of saying okay this particular program and youtube has made everything available i mean the the point i'm making is that media regulation is a very complicated issue and some of us have been arguing that there could be a dividing line between regulating the media and stifling free expression you know in the U in the uk you had a huge report which was presented for the first time the most powerful media baron on the planet rupert murdoch and one guy tried to put some a cream pie on his face but that's besides the point he said it was the most i think he said it like uh, it's the saddest day of my life or something like it has been one of the saddest hours of my life it's a bit like advani and vajpayee saying after the babri masjid was demolished saddest day of my life it's a bit like that he said it's saddest day of my life a 130 year old 
magazine had to be shut down called News of the World because they found that the, the journalists had actually violated the law. They had bribed people and they had not just invaded privacy, they had committed a whole lot of crimes. Okay, now this is the UK for you, all right? Leafson Commission, thick report has come out. So the issue of media ethics and what can be shown and what can't be shown is a complex issue and needs to be discussed and debated and there's no permanent markers. Society is evolving. Society, I mean, uh, who could have imagined uh, what the net would do for everything, for all, all our lives? But the point I'm here making is that many of us have argued that you need perhaps a regulatory authority in the form of a constitutional authority. That if you need, I mean, I, I believe in that and many of us have argued that if you need a regulatory body for the media in this day and age of convergence, it should be something akin to the Supreme Court of India, the Election Commission of India, the Controller and Auditor General of India, you know, uh, a, a body which is uh, constitutionally empowered and would be, in a sense, it could be funded by the government but still be free of government influence and also influence of the corporate sector. So, uh, there were this whole lot of issues concerning media regulation which I hadn't mentioned and I've given examples and I can give you more examples. No, no, I didn't try to point out any flaws in the talk. It was just no, to no, no, no. Fl fl no, I, create I, a flow I, for the questions. Right. Yeah. So, uh, we can collect a group of questions now. So, since we had some extension on the main talk, uh, we can maybe add to it further. Okay, so Sarla and somebody else might want to go for Vedehi and uh, Srinivas. So, we'll go in that order and Vajanti after that. Uh, hi, my name is Sarla and I'm a second year student here at Nalsar. Uh, so I guess I sort of have two questions, one in response to what you just said about uh, sort of, sort of um, basically a response to what uh, Emin just said. Um, and that question would be, uh, how do we as viewers or even members of civil society sort of find that lens to objectively view media and the press? Like for example, uh, a large part of uh, anything that we might see like on the internet or even in the press is also somewhat due to demand unfortunately in the sense what I mean by that is for example I, I didn't understand that last part of what you said it's somewhat it's due, due to demand, demand. Oh, so our demand, demand. Yeah. so what I mean by that is uh, if you have two articles side by side on the internet one about a suicide of a farmer in Andhra Pradesh and the other about say Shah Rukh Khan and like the recent Bollywood gossip unfortunately the one about Shah Rukh Khan does have more clicks and does have more views and as a result you have ads like Fair and Lovely and big corporate companies who would rather put their ads on on uh, prints that talk about you know stuff that we would rather see which unfortunately might be stuff about you know gossip and Bollywood etc like what you just said how do we sort of look at that objectively and sort of take care of that as more of a holistic issue as opposed to just what as opposed to one side and my next question is uh, when you s like obviously uh, yes corporate company uh, influence and advertising influence is a big deal but there's also uh, a hand played by the government and what I mean by that is uh, say f for example a couple years ago like you just spoke about how there needs to be a regulating body that is funded by the government but not necessarily uh, like controlled by the government so a couple years ago uh, I believe the Press Council of India or the government basically put up a group that was meant to sort of monitor corruption in media and uh, things like that. But eventually what happened was they were supposed to put out a report and eventually what happened was that report was basically shut down and tainted by the government itself. So how do you propose that... You're, you're talking about my report, the one I co-authored. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, explain it to you. But sure. I, so I guess my point there is, how exactly do we counter that when you have, you know, when you have this lack of support from the government and the law itself, and not just citizens and media, etc. So those are my questions. So, see, see, I, I'll respond to your question, but maybe I can collect one or two more questions and then I'll deal with each of these questions. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Vedehi Das from the second year. So, sir, um, it would be great if you could elaborate more on the... I'm Bengali. Are you Bengali? Are you Bengali? Are you Bengali? 
Um, so, sir, I'd just like you to shed more light on the covert clandestine buying and selling of information. It could be with regard to social media giants and the government. It could be with regard to governments and newspapers. So in any scape which uh, you could shed light on, if you could... Because in my opinion, I think information, you were talking about it being a commodity or a service. I think it's a commodity now. So if you could just elaborate on that. Thank you. Sir, good morning, sir. This is Srinivas from LLM. Sir, the main aim of the indip independent press is give information about the government affairs and make people aware of democratic values. But present, these media channels are influencing, influenced by political leaders and business magnates. So, how it should be regulated to publish genuine news, sir? All right. All right. Uh, okay. For example, sir, sir, one second. For example, in uh, te Telangana, before it, uh, uh, Inadu, it is uh, supported by TDP. Uh, Telang and, 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 and Sakshi is supported by Jagan Reddy. Jaga, Jagan Mohan what, Sakshi. What, what is KCR's paper? Telangana, sir. Namaste ah, Telangana. There you go. Uh, several uh, newspapers are there. Okay. Okay, fine. sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. We'll take one more question and then I'll respond to you. So, um, I'm Bajanti, I'm from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences School of Public Policy. Uh, some time ago, some time ago, there was uh, this uh, uh, debate uh, that uh, I don't know who initiated it, but Justice Kachdu as well spoke. He uh, he said that there should be a centralized. Um, um, selection process of journalists like in the case of national law schools, engineering and medical schools. I just want your views on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there are very, very interesting questions uh, that you've asked and let me deal with all these questions in some detail because I think it deserves a lot of detail. Let me go back to the question that you asked, Sarla. I, I'll, I'll go in the order that the questions were asked. Are you a citizen first or a consumer? Are you watching your television channel or reading your newspaper because you are getting advertising information, in information in the form of advertisements on what cell phone service you should use, what uh, snack you should purchase, what insurance policy you should go for, what mutual fund you should sell. So, are you a citizen first or a consumer? Let me here try and suggest two or three things to you. This notion of objectivity is a very, very difficult notion. I mean, I could spend a whole hour or two hours just discussing what this word means and why it means different things to different people. Just as this word news means different things to different people at different points of time. You know, I can say for me, news is what a British editor said, news is what someone somewhere wishes to suppress. And the rest is advertising. I could use that definition. Or I could say news is information that you can use, news that you can use. Now wait, it's a little more complicated than that. And I go back to the basics, is should you treat and this is Vaidhi's question as well. Can you and should you treat news or information like any other commodity? And I say no. It's a product, it's a service, and it's in fact more than a product and a service. Because it feeds your brain. It's knowledge. And yes, there is a dividing line between information, which is hard facts, the analysis of that information, the contextualization of the information and from there moving on there to gain knowledge and from that knowledge you could even argue gaining wisdom now these words are loaded words so what's the difference between factually correct and credible information and knowledge and wisdom we can talk about that but the short point and here I'm trying to link two things we here with you the world has changed in recent times because of two individuals the question is do you want to describe them as terrorists or freedom fighters they're all supposed to have violated the laws yet they're lionized 
One of them is Julian Assange and the other is Edward Snowden. Now, do you describe them as whistleblowers? Do you describe them as freedom fighters, people who are fighting so that ordinary citizens get to know information which the rich and the powerful and the influent is trying to conceal? Is that an act of freedom? Or is that violating the law and therefore so-and-so is a terrorist? I mean, this is a question I raise. Because it was said, for instance, the most uh, obvious example is that by leaking information out, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks compromised the security of American soldiers. But when people were asked by various people, including Hillary Clinton, can you prove that? It's difficult to prove. So did you actually compromise lives by leaking information, which is factually correct? The same Julian Assange also leaked information about how an American army helicopter actually killed people in cold blood, including journalists, including photographers. Once again, these ethical issues are very complex. And I'll give you the classic case of Kevin Carter. Kevin Carter was a South African journalist who shot this picture. I mean, he became famous because he was part of this Bang Bang Club and he shot pictures about how during the apartheid regime in South Africa, people were actually being killed by garlanding. They put a, a tire and that tire was burnt and it was one of the most gruesome ways any person could be killed. Uh, this lady is fast asleep. Uh, uh, maybe she should go back home. Uh, sorry to wake you up. But Kevin Carter also shot a picture of in Sudan, which was undivided then, of a vulture almost trying to attack an emaciated young child with a distended belly whose mother had gone to a relief camp of the United Nations to get food. And the story is Kevin Carter waited for a considerable period of time for both the vulture and that emaciated baby to come into the same frame. And his picture was front page by all the leading publications of the world. And the same Kevin Carter, after he took this picture which won him a Pulitzer Prize and a whole lot of things, eventually killed himself. He was in his early 30s when he killed himself. And if you read that a note which is supposed to be a suicide note, you'll understand why he did it. He was racked with guilt because he was criticized that you are a journalist, you are a photographer, you are taking this picture for what? Wasn't it your job to show off that vulture? Or was it your job to highlight the pathetic condition of those people in Sudan and would that help them? Would there be more aid coming in? Would the lives of these people improve? This conflict. I'm giving you these ethical dilemmas because I believe they are very, very important. Somalia? Yeah, you could be right. Uh, it's in my phone. I, I'm sorry, I may be wrong about the location. It's also in my book. Uh, it could be Somalia or Ethiopia. Somalia, Somalia you're right. I'm, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. Now, the issue that people have here talked about is the fact the political economy of the media also, in a sense, reflects the political media of the world and the country we live in. So if politicians and if business person, the question that you asked, they are in positions of power and authority, they are also trying to control what you see, what you read, what you hear. Right? Because they are the ones who own the media. Right? So this, when you mention your state, it's happening. Sometimes, maybe it's happening in a very brazen and a blatant manner here. Maybe it's happening elsewhere in a more subtle manner. Maybe the same person who raves and rants and says, journalists, you should be tried because you are anti-national, suddenly becomes a meek pussycat when he has to interview the Prime Minister of India. I think you know who I'm talking about. 
Now, to move to this point about paid news, it's a report that you can read, it's in the public domain. But let me give you the sequence of events. Two of us were asked by the Press Council of India to prepare a report over how essentially in the run-up to the 2009 elections and the assembly elections later that year, how there was a lot of paid news, how, how the media was bribed to put out favorable articles in favor of specific candidates standing for elections and political parties or sometimes to trash the other side as well, uh, the political opponents. I mean, we had ridiculous examples. The same page of the Gujarat Samachar had two articles on the same page and two people are fighting, two candidates are fighting with each other and in the same page they have two articles saying so and so candidate is likely to win with a huge, likely to win with a huge majority in the same page. Ashok Chavan, the former Chief Minister of Maharashtra, I asked him this question, a show which Saimath actually brought out, that look there are three newspapers which are supposed to be competing with each other, Lokmat, Pudhari, etc. And they have three articles which are identical, the first word to the last word. Only the byline of the correspondent is different. How do you explain it? He suggested that sometimes journalists are lazy. Of course they are. So they reproduce the handout which was given to them. The election commission ruled against him. Abhishek Manu Singhvi fought it in the Supreme Court. Eventually, Ashok Chavan, this was a test case. It's his own, uh, the person who lost the election, he fought it. But establishing or proving exchange of funds, quid pro quo, was not easy in a court of law. And as far as I know, that entire case is still in limbo. But Sainath will be in a better position to answer that. But there were some very obvious examples. When Mrs. Yadav, what was her name? Uh, Yadav, uh, who became the first, no, 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 judge, no. This is a lady who was an MLA who was disqualified from standing for elections. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, she's a very famous lady, rather infamous lady. She became the first elected member of a legislative assembly who was barred from contesting elections. Why? Because the newspaper concerned said that ADVT, in small typeface at the bottom of the page, they had those four letters, ADVT, meaning advertising. And Umlesh Yadav, I'm sorry, Umlesh Yadav. And, and she was disqualified by the Election Commission of India. Umlesh Yadav actually is very famous, infamous for different reasons. Her husband is sometimes has been derogatorily described as the dawn of Ghaziabad. Most importantly, she also happens to be, it's purely incidental, it's got nothing to do with the case of paid news. She happens to be the mother of Vikas Yadav, who divides his time between Tihar Jail and the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, because he's the person who's been accused for the murder of both Nitish Katara and Jessica Lal. The Press Council of India's report on paid news was deliberated on by another committee set up by the Press Council of India. We chose not to disclose the full report to the government, but give a short version of it containing the recommendations and observations to the government. Manu Mudgil moved the Central Information Commission and roughly 14 months later, the full text of that report was put on the website of the Press Council in India where you can still find it with a disclaimer saying that the council had not unanimously approved the contents of this report. 
it's in the public domain the press council of india doesn't operate like a parliamentary committee where members who disagree with the recommendations can put in what are called dissenting notes but the interesting part of the story is that long before the report of the press council of india titled paid news how corruption in the indian media undermines democracy 14 months before it became an official document on the website of the press council of india with a disclaimer that i pointed out it became a public document you know how shrinivas reddy and me who authored the report go authored the report we asked the then chairman of the press council of india and the then sec and the secretary she is still the secretary of the council madam how do you want us to submit this report you want to give us a hard copy in a compact disc in a pen drive he says why bother email it to us so it was emailed to them and within a few days we realized that the chairman the secretary and the two authors besides them 26 other people had been had got the report because it had been forwarded to them on the email now you know what happens when 30 copies of a report are circulating in cyberspace it becomes quite easy for that document to become a public document if you want to know more on this go in details about this uh, outlook magazine on its website published a detailed report on who voted in favor of disclosing the report and who voted against it who abstained from voting uh we who wanted the report uh to be presented to the government we lost out but it's interesting you can get the names one of the people who uh, abstained no 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 one of the persons who voted against the report being made public is a former minister of information and broadcasting he's an important minister now even now uh so the last point that i wanted to make is a point that vijayanti made yes you have to have a law degree to practice law correct you have to look like a penguin to appear in court correct there are no qualifications to be a journalist there are no qualifications to be a politician right so should we quit them as justice kadju wants us i know quite a few college dropouts who communicate quite well they don't have a ba degree i know quite a few 10th class fail who subsequently went up to become very powerful important politicians uh, i am biased because i've been a journalist for almost 40 years i've been around on this planet longer than most of you have been uh, i'm old enough to be your father most of your father uh, all those who have fathers who are not yet senior citizens please remember i could have been your father my child my daughter is only 14 years old and my son is 12 but i personally don't think vijayanti to answer your question that there should be such qualifications even if you assume that a newspaper can't employ me or a television channel can't employ me because i don't have a ba or a bsc or a ma or a bcom what the hell does it matter wtf you know that word don't you f dot dot k you know it said instrument to use to have noodles in with so that's it uh covert sharing of information what is covert everything is today available for everybody what is secret about our lives how secretive can we be today with drones today with every single word even my mobile phone is shut and my laptop has been shut somebody can activate it and record every single word i'm saying somebody who's 10000 miles away every single 
moment of my life and your life and every single one of the seven billion plus people on this planet, every single moment of that can be recorded and stored in some computer. We've gone beyond the days of targeted surveillance. Today we have days of mass surveillance. The only problem is that who processes the data, who listens to all these conversations. If it's Ms. Radia, it's a separate story. If it's the SR tapes, it's another story. So I do believe, and if you do believe, that transparency is good for society, then a free and an independent and an autonomous media which is also independent uh, financially, then it's good for human society. It doesn't mean that I support a webcam being placed in every bathroom. No, I don't support that. But uh, when we say transparency, I mean transparency in public life. I think that's very important and that strengthens democracy. And that's where the media is the fourth state. That's where the media uh, can hold those in positions of power accountable. That's where the media, together with the CHE, together with the judiciary, together with the Election Commission of India, can hold, uh, can ensure that power is not abused, power is not misused, that discretionary powers are used in a, a, a judicious manner. So this is really what I wanted to say. But uh, if there are some more questions, I will be happy to answer them. Okay, I think there is one more question there. Yeah. Hello. <coughs> Sir, uh, you said that there is uh, regulatory anarchy prevailing in media. So, anarchy is a uh, quite a big word to use. So, could you could you illustrate that with an example? And uh, uh, on the other hand, you said that uh, it is quite evident also that there is wide scale corruption, paid news, and all. So, it clearly says that regulatory structure is failing. Or, or it's improper. Then, then what? If you have to suggest three changes to to make it proper or get uh, get it back onto the track, what what would they be? Okay. Uh, I I'll go over some of the points I make to repeat the points I made. In Mumbai, journalists were accused of aiding terrorists. They were, yeah? They said by actually putting out conversations of so-called terrorists, people could, I, you know, you actually helped those who had kidnapped people in the Taj Hotel, etc., etc. You also had a situation after that where you, the Prime Minister of that time, Manmohan Singh, he called everybody and he said, we are being told by the security agencies that you are st overstepping the line. Then the question is, why did you allow journalists to come in right in front and shoot everything and have a 72-hour live broadcast of what was happening? In between, a former Prime Minister Vishwanath Pratap Singh died, but very few people noticed that on the small scroll at the bottom of the screen. But wait, when I say anarchy, it means chaos. I give you that example of the US where in the Janet Jackson episode the television channel was first fine had to pay the fine and then move court against the imposition of the fine in India we don't have such a situation then I argued why self-regulation also fails you know in an ideal world self-regulation is the best form of regulation but we don't live in an ideal world, no? What do you do with the crooks and the criminals elements in the midst of the media? What do you do about them? Let me give you an example. The News Broadcasting Standards Authority of India had once hauled up when Justice J.S. Verma was the head of the News Broadcasting Standards Authority for plain simple intellectual property rights and copyright theft. What was it that there was a Pakistani woman who
who had been quoted in one of the news agencies, if I remember correctly, it was Reuters. Her picture had been fished out from the net. Her picture was put on the thing. And what she said was ostensibly tra uh, translated into Hindi. And there was a voiceover. So the impression that a viewer would have got is that this lady on a phone in had been speaking to the channel, which is India TV, headed by Mr. Rajat Sharma. Now hear me out. Reuters moved the channel and said, you violated a copyright. This lady was told about it and she said, look, you've not only violated copyright of Reuters, you have selectively used what I've said. You've quoted me out of context. The channel ran an apology. Because Reuters threatened them that we, you know, you violated our copyright. We violated this lady. You've not mentioned that this lady's comments have been taken from Reuters. You put her picture on them. After all this happened, after the channel apologized, the News Broadcasting Standards Authority of India, headed by Justice Verma, it's a self-regulatory body, it imposed a fine. I think if I remember correctly about a lakh of rupees on the channel. And then the channel said, how can you impose the same fine on me again and again? And not only a fine, put it up prominently that I apologize, I say sorry, etc., etc., etc. Why should I be punished twice was the question that was asked. And at one point of time, Mr. Rajat Sharma threatened to walk out of the association which has set up the News Broadcasting Standards Authority, which is called the NBA, the News Broadcasters Association. It's a separate matter that later on Rajat Sharma became the head of the News Broadcasters Association. But at that point of time, he wanted to walk out. He said, why, why is it punishing me twice? This example also gives you an, a, a, the, the problem. You see, if you, when you have a self-regulatory body, what, are, what about those who don't subscribe to that self-regulatory body? You know, there might be hundreds of television channels, but only 30 are members of this body. I said, why should I become a member of this association and why should I, should I adhere to the, the informal guidelines that have been put up by the, the News Broadcasting Standards Authority? In the absence of that, you have anarchy. So the question is, I have made an entire film on this at some point of time. If you want to see it, I can show it to you. Do you show a person who's committing suicide? Do you show that picture live? It actually happened. Gopal Krishn Kashyap in Patiala in Punjab before the elections. Are you journalists first? Are you photographers first? Are you human beings first? Same question I'm asking you, the dilemma. What is the way forward? I do believe that that regulatory authority, and here I'm repeating myself, has to be a constitutional authority. And because the media is so important in human lives and human society and becoming increasingly more so, such a body should be, in my opinion, be a constitutional authority. We can discuss about who should be its, how the head should be selected. So I, I'm putting such a body on par with the bodies like the Supreme Court, the Apex Court, with the Election Commission, with CAG. CVC is not such a powerful body. And most importantly, this body should be empowered to punish. You know, as, as a member of the Press Council of India, you remember there was this case of this uh, a tribal woman, an Adivasi woman in Guwahati, who was stripped naked in the middle of the street and there were pictures taken. Most pa pa papers who published that picture concealed her nakedness. They would blur her breasts and her pubic region. Why? Because you don't print it in a newspaper. There was one paper that did. It's the same way that a media is supposed to depict a victim of rape. It's the same way that a media is supposed to de de detect a person who has been accused of a crime or a child. You conceal that person's identity. So you silhouette, etc., etc. In this case, they didn't, that newspaper. But the Press Council of India couldn't do anything except tell that newspaper, sorry, you should not have done this. Censure it. 
so this is why i'm saying what how do you deal with the criminals do you need a special set of laws maybe you don't there are enough provisions in the indian penal code and the criminal procedure code that could take action but the question is one of enforcement you know and i know you can have a law which is poorly implemented whether it be relating to child marriage or whether it be relating to child labor so it's not so much the law but the implementation of the law that becomes very very important here yes please this is my suggestion i mean nobody gives a damn about my views but that's all right you know i think a time will come when there will be public pressure why why do i say this at the end of the day the pressure has to come from the bottom civil society there was a case of a television channel which was headed by sudeep choudhury at that point of time called live india where a particular woman a school teacher was accused of enticing her students into commercial sex it was a doctored sting operation the journalist concerned was put behind bars for a short period of time the channel which aired the video at the time the video was aired there was a big mob that assembled outside a school she was virtually stripped she didn't press charges against this person she said my reputation in any case is ruined people said that what has she had some business dealings and that was uh, cut and spliced and diced to give an impression that she was uh, trying to entice one of her students into prostitution how did it all come out the same woman who was the dummy of this journalist i should name him his name is prakash singh spilled the beans ashutosh who happened to head ib and seven said i'm not going to show this video prove to me bring her in front of me it's a separate matter that this same character prakash singh was briefly engaged his services were briefly engaged possibly not as an employee but perhaps as uh, some sort of an associate by navin jindal's company the same navin jindal who mounted a sting operation on 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 the z television people uh, sudhir choudhury and uh, samir uh, samir aluwalia correct so i'm naming names i'm naming all these names all right youtube huh? they they can watch everything huh? they can take me to court maan hani maine kiya na main to i'm not just saying i don't like your shirt i'm saying you're a criminal huh? in front of everybody you can take me to court na <laughs> so so that's that was really uh, the the point i'm i was trying to make is that in today's we are a mediated society our society is today the media influences every single moment of our lives what do we do with the black sheep what do we do with the criminals i am not in favor of criminal defamation i believe that it should be a civil offense but justice deepak mishra has a different point of view i mean he says the right to reputation is as important as the right to free expression and interestingly he clarified his own judgment in a subsequent uh, in a court observation you wanted to ask me a question good afternoon my name is vijay from the school of public policy and governance uh, tata institute of social sciences my question is related to the neera neera radia tapes and uh, i would like your assessment on it my understanding of it when i see it i see neera radia as somebody who is probably the only person in that entire scenario as somebody who is doing her job as a lobbyist whereas I, if i do see if somebody has breached an ethical 
a contract of their professionalism it would probably be the corporate houses or the journalists or the politicians involved so i would like to understand from you what your reading of the entire episode is okay and if i could just add a little bit more i haven't heard about the deera rabia tapes in a long time now so is it something that's out of public memory for i i yeah. i understand from sources usually reliable that miss radia is uh, very very deeply religious visits temples very frequently and organizes pilgrimages but i think what miss radia's conversations when it entered the public domain it was it was a very very significant moment uh in the contemporary history of the media in this country because a huge volume of information uh was leaked out and uh a lot of information entered the public domain which tarnished the reputation of three very prominent journalists barkha dad veer sangvi and prabhu chawla what the what the radia conversation disclosed was something we all knew and as you rightly pointed out she was doing her job with diligence because she was after all a lobbyist for two of the richest men in this country mukesh ambani and ratan tata she was doing her job she was being paid to do that job a whole lot of people sort of agreed that they shouldn't have said what they did that they had a loose tongue among them was of course uh, mr tarun das the former head of the uh, the director general of the confederation of indian industry he said my loose tongue i shouldn't have said it he slapped himself as an oh me and my loose tongue what did he say he said something which everybody knows that there is a mr 10% who's efficient and a mr 10% who's not efficient you know we are good indians we are good hindus so we did distinguish between the more corrupt and the less corrupt we also distinguish between the corrupt and efficient and the corrupt and inefficient wo sala paisa bhi khata magar kaam nahi karta kitna gandha bante hai paisa kha ke bhi kaam nahi karta so mr das distinguished between a former transport minister shri balu who who ensured that highways were built mainly in tamil nadu and he said we prefer mr kamal nath he's a mr 10% but he does the highways are built on time then he says oh my god he 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 in karan thapar's program he said i'm so sorry this is loose conversation which ended so what the radio conversations did was what was discussed in whispers in cocktail parties behind closed doors entered the public domain and it involved all the big names mr tata ratan tata moved the court on invasion of privacy nothing has happened the supreme court said that there is possible evidence of criminality in number of cases and those are still pending the supreme court is still uh, uh, the the cbi etc still investigating it but there's an important point i want to flag the radia conversations were known before they became public by it was made public by two weeklies open magazine and outlook magazine around the same time or a little before it was printed in outlook and in open prashant bhushan gave this cd to the supreme court there were many things in the in the cd which were not uh which you can say the journalists self censored censored self censored you did not put it out in the public domain for example there was a discussion in the radia conversations about a particular prominent industrialists love for women from a particular central asian country women whose morals were questioned there was a very well known case about neera radia complaining to one of her com- one of her uh one of her uh, colleagues that a well known co- columnist by the name of miss shobha day had interviewed mrs neeta ambani and then without telling them had actually broken up the interview into two parts so she had gone and done the interview for hello magazine 
but ended up giving portions of the interview to Goodbye magazine as well. Uh, no, I'm, that name is wrong. I mean, since everything is being recorded, I also have to be a little careful about what I say. But these are some conversations in the radio, con in the radio recordings or radio tapes, as they were called. Though the, those days they used tapes, these days they don't use tapes, which were not there in the public domain. One because it was felt it was not so important. So big deal, Shobha De did what she did. So what if Neera Radia is unhappy? Or we can't publish these sal salacious allegations about a prominent industrious life. But a lot entered the public domain. And you know what happened after that. If you want to know greater details, read, read my other late Vinod Mehta's uh, biography. Two, he has uh, his biographies in two parts. Editor Unplugged, this is the second part of it. The earlier one is the Lucknow Boy. So I think, uh, again, I'm giving you a long answer to your question. The radio conversations are significant because this whole issue is again coming up again and again. The leakage of conf information considered confidential. I am arguing that we are moving towards a world where less and less information can be treated as confidential. Whether it be <coughs> thanks to Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Panama Papers, Neera Radia, or the more recent one, the SR tapes. So is it good that every single word you utter, every single word you write or consign or put, which is stored in the hard disk, not of your memory, but a computer or a handheld device, is likely to be read, watched, heard by somebody else?